Welcome to The Lens with me, Sarah Travers. The Lens is a business in the community podcast in partnership with One Young World. I'm delighted that our guests today are Niall Martindale, CEO of Firmus Energy, and Luke Gibson, COO of Field Energy UK. Now, in this episode, we'll be exploring energy in all of its forms, the demand for energy, the current challenges with the energy crisis, what energy firms are doing about it, how they're taking the responsible route, even when things are out of their control, and why taking care of the planet will always be a major priority. To find out more, let's get into the conversation. Niall, Luke, welcome to The Lens. So Niall, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how your career has developed to bring you to the role of CEO of Firmus Energy. So I graduated from the University of Ulster up there on the northwest coast of Northern Ireland. And I did a degree, Sarah, in science with business. And then I headed off to the UK for a number of years returning about five or six years later to Dublin. And in that time, I developed my career within what we call demand forecasting, but very much within the electronics sector. And it was shortly after my return to Dublin, I was made aware of a role with the gas industry in Northern Ireland as a business planning manager. So having come from electronics, where we're dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of products on a daily basis, I thought gas, one product, how difficult can it be? So I progressed through the gas industry and joined Firmus Energy uh, seven years ago, just over seven years ago at this stage, as Director of Regulation. And over the last year, I've been very, very proud to take the reins really at, at what I believe to be a, a fantastic business. A really interesting journey for you. Just describe Firmus Energy then to those who are maybe not from Northern Ireland, which has a very different gas networking system than other parts of the UK. We are the only bundled natural gas business in Northern Ireland. We have a distribution arm and we have a supply retail arm. So on the distribution side, we dig up the roads and put in the pipe and we put meters on the walls of homes and businesses and that's 100% regulated. On the other side of our business, we uh, essentially go out and get the gas. We buy, purchase gas for our customers and we ship it through the networks, not just our own networks, other networks here in Northern Ireland, and we deliver the gas and then obviously bill the customer for the delivery of that gas. But it puts us very much on both sides of the fence and a fairly unique position. We are the largest supplier of natural gas here in Northern Ireland. Well, I have learned something already about bundled, so that's good. Every day's a school day on the lens. Luke, if I can turn to you now, if you want to tell us a little bit about your role and what your business does. My role is Chief Operating Officer at Field. I've had a bit more of a potted history to get into energy. There's quite a lot of people in energy who've just been in energy all their career. Uh, so I'm maybe one of the odd one out. I graduated from Bristol. I went into finance and equity research, working for hedge funds and stuff, analyzing companies. Got a bit disconnected from reality, I think, at that stage. of It all felt a bit like numbers on a screen versus the real reality. And I, I then went a bit left field, started a shoe business. I then went and joined a, in Barcelona a food delivery company called Globo uh, and scaled that up over three years and a bit of a crazy journey from like Barcelona to like 30 countries. And then got into the big 10 minute grocery wars. And then I got to a point when I was thinking, uh, does the world really need 10 minute grocery deliveries? Which the answer is no. The energy crisis obviously was coming up and it's been something that was always on my mind. And I joined Field. The opportunity at the company just seemed so blindingly obvious. We basically developed build and operate energy grid scale energy storage assets. So basically, we charge up these large scale batteries, we charge them up when there's a higher proportion of renewables on the grid, uh, and discharge them when otherwise the grid would have to turn on more carbon intensive and more expensive energy sources. So, so typically gas peaker plants, think of these as a couple of acres of shipping containers with batteries inside them. And it's quite a complicated process to tell them how they operate, when do they charge and discharge based on price prediction, carbon prediction, all sorts of things. My goodness. Well, I've learned something new again. So that, that is fascinating. And, and I suppose we're, we're talking about an energy crisis. We're in the midst of an energy crisis, something that perhaps we knew was coming with climate change, the focus on climate change, the focus on moving away from, from fossil fuels. But then we have the war in Ukraine. The rest is history. Um, Niall, you only became CEO uh, of Firmus this year. 
So you were taking on an awful lot because the gas industry, well, it hasn't had an easy ride. There hasn't been great coverage in the media and people calling for all sorts of windfall taxes, the energy companies just getting richer, people at home, the working poor, not able to heat their homes and eat. And you have been targeted. What's that been like? It's been challenging, absolutely challenging. I think the first thing I would have to, I suppose, acknowledge is the challenge for our customers. We are acutely aware of what the cost of living crisis, and of course, the energy is part of that. And we've been, to be quite frank, having to work extra hard to make sure that we get through this crisis with our customers and stand side by side with them through the current challenges. That being said, our staff, employees, you know, have have equally been challenged in terms of managing our way as a business through the crisis. I've joined a business, and I've, I've, I say put it as taking the reins of a business now, that I believe is going to deliver. We will move to the next very, very exciting phase in, in our journey towards renewable energy, and we are determined to bring our customers and everyone else along with us. Yes, in the short term, it's challenging. There is light at the end of the tunnel, and, and I believe there's a very very bright future for energy here in Northern Ireland and, and particularly for this energy. And I know you're on your journey already to carbon net zero by 2050. I'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, Luke, for you, out of crisis, uh, you know, comes innovation, comes opportunity. Um, the energy crisis is good for business for you. Yes, I mean, I would start by saying energy price volatility was increasing dramatically before Ukraine happened, right? This is a trend that basically as you more, add build more and more renewables, you create more intermittency of supply because it can't run consistently like gas. It's not always windy or sunny. And so price volatility was increasing anyway. Then what happened with Ukraine is it, quite frankly, artificially increased that. And we'll, we, after hopefully if some of that, that crisis sort of dies down, we hope, things will normalise a bit. But the reality is volatility will remain high um, as you add more and more renewables. The point of energy storage and in particular batteries is they take advantage of that volatility because they basically buy when the price is low, when there's lots of wind and it's cheap, and then sell when the price is high and they can be cheaper than gas, for example. It brings down the cost for bills and obviously good for net zero. If I could just come in there as well, and natural gas is a fossil fuel and our future is biomethane. I know we're, we're getting there, but in the current challenges, the silver lining in this cloud is probably the biggest call to action and the loudest and clearest call to action to do something different and to stimulate something progressive. And we are very much at the forefront of that and very much working with other stakeholders to to get there. It's perhaps back to to Luke's point. One of the key challenges at the minute is not just the high prices, but I I would agree with Luke, it's the volatility of those prices. And as we look to the future and biomethane and the circular economy, that is one of the key benefits of what you described as perhaps indigenous energy here in Northern Ireland from renewable sources. We can lower the price, make it more affordable, and almost as importantly, make it stable for homes and businesses. So Niall, this would be using the existing infrastructure, but having a greener gas. Talk us through biomethane. How will you get it? This is something that Northern Ireland is way up the league tables on in terms of the opportunity for biomethane, in particular here in Northern Ireland. And it doesn't just address the natural gas challenge with fossil fuel and so forth, but we can diversify into agriculture, we can diversify the transport sector. It transcends all sectors of the economy here in Northern Ireland. But the abundance of what we would call feedstock to feed anaerobic digestion, to produce biomethane is enormous. We have 83% of our gas demand residing in currently operating AD plants within 10 kilometres of our network. Now, 10 kilometres might sound a lot, but it's not for the guys who are out uh, doing our construction day in, day out. The point is the opportunity is massive and, and we need to grasp it and we are working to do so. Then I think the public that we're going, what, if, if the answer's there, the solution's there, why is it not happening quicker? Good question. And I think with every change, there needs to be a stimulus. Well, currently we have 80 or so AD plants in Northern Ireland. They are producing a gas, biomethane, uh, from anaerobic digestion. But that gas is being used, to be frank, elsewhere in, in other parts of, um, 
of, of the industry, if not producing electricity and so on and so forth, but the gas is not coming into the pipes. There's a number of things, technical and regulatory, those lines will be crossed by the end of 2022. We will have the frameworks in place to allow injection into our grid. Uh, and we would expect to see the first injections into the gas grid here in Northern Ireland uh, within the first half of 2023. So we are progressing. One very important point to make in terms of our asset, there's 1.2 billion pounds worth of investment in the asset here in Northern Ireland. And believe it or not, you do come across the odd network connoisseur uh, across Europe. And if you're a gas network connoisseur, you will look to Northern Ireland uh, with envy. We have a polyethylene, uh, so it's a plastic asset, and it is primed and ready. It can ship biomethane tomorrow. It can ship up to 20% blended hydrogen into the network tomorrow. We are leagues ahead of many other countries, certainly across Europe and indeed worldwide. But what will that mean to customers' bills and energy bills? What will that mean for them? There's two key aspects. One is the quantum of the price, so how high or low the price is, the affordability, if we put it in those terms. And the second one is the volatility. If we are producing biomethane locally and that industry is allowed to progress and build, we will have affordable energy available to us through biomethane and indeed blended hydrogen. It will be stable by comparison to what we're currently exposed to on more global markets. Obviously, with an energy crisis, we've talked about opportunity. The the media portrayal, though, is, is a very negative situation. If you had a crystal ball and you were looking ahead, do you think this energy crisis will be in the rear view mirror in 10 years time? Despite the very obvious and acute challenges to, to customers and businesses, that call to action is something that is driving a significant impetus, if you like, into the momentum in, in renewable gas. The nature of the conversations, the intensity of the conversations with many, many stakeholders, government, regulators and indeed industry players is pushing that agenda forward. I do see a significant acceleration over the last 12 months, Sarah, in terms of accelerating us towards that uh, renewable horizon. Firmus Energy has all, always prided itself in being a great place to work. But over the last while, especially those perhaps in, in customer services, I understand a lot of negative calls have, have come in and they've had to deal with a lot of situations that perhaps they didn't ever expect to find themselves in. What's that been like to lead your people and what have you been doing to support them? The nature of the calls that we've received over the last 12 months to, to 18 months are significantly more challenging, but having said that, understandably more challenging. And we've always taken huge pride in the service that we provide to customers, and that hasn't dipped whatsoever in the last 12 to 18 months. But we have had to take measures to, to shore that up Communication is key, so we talk a lot to our staff and we encourage them to talk a lot to us. But of course, then there's the more practical measures in terms of additional training. And that's training of two aspects is that one, for example, with mental health support for our staff, but number two, specialised training such as the topics of autism and dementia and financial vulnerability, of course, is, is a particular one at the moment. So we've upped the training and that does two things. It ensures that when a customer uh, comes on the call with any of our staff, that they're going to get a, a particularly empathetic and informed customer service as best as we can provide that customer service. But what it also does is ensure that those people taking the calls on behalf of Firmus Energy are better placed to manage the call. The one last thing I would say is encourage positivity. Even within the challenging times, we do get, and, and you'd be surprised how many positive uh, comments and, and, and bits and pieces of feedback that we get into the business and, and into me, particularly in terms of teams and individuals within the business. And we celebrate that uh, positivity. Let's talk more about net zero. Uh, the UK has committed to net zero by 2050. We've already mentioned that Firmus is, is, has that in its targets too. Let's find a little bit more about um, Field Energy UK then, Luke. What is your business doing to work towards that target? Are you attempting to get there sooner? Our last detailed life cycle assessment of one of our projects, it was we're saving 115,000 tonnes of carbon from from enter, entering the atmosphere over the next 20 years. 
that's for a 20 megawatt site. We, we have this effect of basically enabling renewables and displacing very, very carbon intensive gas usage. Now, having said that, if there was a way of storing that energy that was even less carbon intensive, then we would do that also. You still need to build the batteries. They still have a carbon impact. If you look at like the breakdown of the transportation costs, the construction costs, the cost in terms of carbon this is, uh, and then you look at the operations, the displacement effect dwarfs any of the other costs in terms of carbon. So gradually uh, looking at new and different and interesting energy storage technologies, whether that's uh, different types of flow batteries, compressed air solutions, all sorts of things. So lots of innovation ahead and, and more solutions to come. Niall, Will you make 2050? Yes. Definitely. We and definitely we will. For us to sustain our business and to sustain customers in terms of what, the, what customers are now expecting from us, it is renewable gas. Our whole strategy within Firmus Energy is driving us towards net zero carbon and being part of that delivery. Last December, the government here published their energy strategy and they recognised the critical role that the networks would play in supporting the overall delivery of net zero. Given that Firmus has been in the news so often about, you know, price hikes and gas, that sort of thing, are other people going to appear, other organisations, other companies in competition with you or what way do you see your future that way? In short, well, we're one of three networks in Northern Ireland, but certainly we're the only network within our particular licensed area. Uh, and as such, the obligation very much falls to us to deliver net zero to our customers within that area. So at the very fundamental basis, we have four key values within the business. And those four key values are not words written on the wall, Sarah. Those four values are what we live and breathe every single day. We come in through the offices. So that hasn't changed. We will take the challenges that we have at the moment. We will work really hard and harder than ever to get through those with our customers. The opportunity, not just for us as a business, but the opportunity for our customers to avail of renewable energy in the future is so strong. You sound so positive, but I'm sure that's hard at times. No, I, I, I think as a business, we're a very positive business, but that most certainly does not uh, in any way diminish the the recognition of the impacts of the present challenges within the industry we are as i said there we're working super hard harder than ever to make sure that we can get through those challenges and we're doing the best for our customers we're doing our best for vulnerable customers and the most vulnerable in those communities we serve we, we take that very very seriously and we always have done we will continue to do so so i i wouldn't like my positivity to be in any way diluting those effects and that real impact that we are working hard to address. I'd love to know if you have any questions you'd like to ask each other. Luke, would you have a question for Niall? I'm interested in the way he sees renewables and like gas more generally in the kind of long term net zero view and what role he sees his gas playing versus renewables with storage, for example. On both ends of the spectrum, right, you, you have you have people who are like Full on. We need just we just electrify almost everything uh, apart from apart from some long haul transportation and, and industrial uses, and then you have others who are much more bullish on on the gas side of things. Just interesting where where he where he sort of sits on that spectrum. And you know, obviously, there's been some challenges around biomethane as well. With any of these technologies, there's always someone on the other side, and that's a sort of healthy, robust debate. But yeah, in, intrigued where he, where he sees that playing out in a very long term view. And the second piece is around volatility as a supplier. In terms of in GB with the supplier issues, the government implemented a, a price cap, which made it very challenging for, they basically they welcomed lots of competition, and then they introduced a price cap to protect consumers, which made it very hard for suppliers to hedge effectively, or have the capital to hedge. Just interesting how that played out and how that could have been managed better. Probably two quite meaty questions. On the first one, yes, I recognise and I'm, I'm fully committed to the role of the gas networks to deliver on renewable energy for the future but i i've said this publicly on many 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 occasions and, and, and perhaps it's stating the obvious there is no silver bullet and actually the cornerstone to the delivery of net zero carbon in northern ireland for me is collaboration it's exactly what you said there is not one industry sector or business who will deliver on their own net zero carbon this collaboration and actually i see that as not just the cornerstone but actually one of the key challenges is to get everybody singing from the same page 
and everybody pointing in the same direction and everybody more importantly recognizing the benefits and the advantages perhaps of other sectors and and, and that perhaps commercially at times to be frank is easier said than done but unless it is done we will not achieve net zero carbon and, and i've been very open uh, in terms of the recognition on behalf of Firmus Energy that, that we are part of a wider collaboration to deliver net zero. The second one in terms of supplier agility, we are not price capped in the same way that GBR. Our tariffs, or certainly a number of our tariffs, are regulated. However, the agility that we have within our license to move on tariffs means that we are not as sensitive to those working capital pressures that, that you've just alluded to that put 29 businesses out of business uh, at the end of 2021. We, we are not there. We are more agile. That certainly has supported our resilience through the last 12 months. And Niall, would you like to ask any questions of Luke? There was one thing in terms of your experience in the renewable side. Do you believe, Luke, there's a role for government incentivization subsidies and or grants in terms of delivering that zero by 2050? Yeah, absolutely. It's fundamentally critical, particularly for new technology deployment. But basically what we see in the in the space, say, say let's take something that specifically that I'm, I know a lot about, which is energy storage, for example, of which there's many technologies competing. At the moment, the, the winner in that technology race is, is LFP technology, lithium ion phosphate. Most of those cells for those batteries are all manufactured in, in China. It's all part of the kind of EV race, and that's got to manufacturing scale, costs have come down, it makes sense to build these grid scale batteries financially. Now, if you look at all the other new technologies, you just see most of them are kind of pilot stage or pre-commercial readiness, and they're talking about how their, you know, learning rate will reduce costs dramatically in the future. You need people willing to go and deploy that to bring the cost down, to bring up manufacturing, and the cost of that is so high that you need, it's, it is a little bit winner takes all to a certain extent with these technologies. And if you don't have government support to get those up and running, they will just never, ever get built because they'll never get to commercial scale and never be cost effective. And you will end up with, with limited competition and potentially a suboptimal solution. The other thing that I think is phenomenally important, I've done a lot of work looking at most of the European grids, actually, uh, and we're now in Italy, we're soon to go into Germany. The, the thing that's consistent in is every market has its own challenges with with their grip but all of them are massively scaling up renewable generation but the biggest issue is the grid itself and grid reinforcement and essentially battery storage is almost like a bit of a swiss army knife or a, a, a essentially a sticky plaster uh, over actual grid reinforcement work which is incredibly slow and i think the biggest challenge is at the moment in some markets the budget allocated to actual grid reinforcement works is linked to consumer bills Somebody in government is not incentivized to go and put loads of money on a long-term plan to reinforce the grid because it's very unpopular because it's yeah. going to bring up bills. I think it would be really, really valuable if that was taken out and put in general taxation and then you'd have a much more long-term plan. Because it's limited by this cost to consumers point, you're always thinking a little bit short-term and therefore you're always paying, the grid is always paying catch-up and it's going to really struggle to build out the level of grid reinforcement needed to sustain the amount of generation we're going to have on the grid and particularly in markets where you have quite long thin grids or you have particularly islanded places or you have interconnectors coming in and creating congestion there's all sorts of problems going on the grids right now and it's only going to get worse batteries can solve some of that but you need grid reinforcement to happen fast Um, my biggest concern is private companies will be able to build out stuff but the grid reinforcement is not private the problem is can it operate as fast as private competition does and i think that's that's the sort of imbalance that maybe worries me more than anything. Mm, a real concern, yeah, I'm sure. Uh, Luke, I'd also love to hear about your experience of One Young World while we're on this podcast. Um, how did you get involved with it and what does being a One Young World ambassador mean for you personally? So yeah, I got involved maybe eight years ago. I was working for a, a charity uh, in the DRC. Uh, and anyway, we were raising money out there and uh, supporting entrepreneurs basically out there. Somebody at One Young World then reached out and then we ended up, or me and somebody else ended up going. The main takeaway was an overriding sense of enthusiasm and belief in people actually doing extraordinary things. I think that is tempered by practicality, but the enthusiasm is, it's certainly very infectious. I would say it probably did change my mindset mindset at that point. Because at that point I was working at a corporate and I was very frustrated. The people that were really impressive were the people who were like, 
doing architecture in Soweto or something and you're like, how? I, I can't even... I, it's just so impressive. So uh, yeah, that was really inspiring. Great. Okay. Yeah. Now, business in the community is encouraging businesses to go faster, braver and bolder in the decisions they're making for the benefit of people and the planet. So we're asking people to think about this in three ways. So how is your business being fairer to your people, greener in its treatment of the planet and working together with communities? So I'd like to ask each of you, how is your business doing that? Niall. Our people are our greatest assets and, and, and without them, well, we don't have a firmness and we don't have a, a network. We do invest in making sure that our people are trained to the best that they can be trained within the business. And that's a continual cycle. We're investing at the moment in a re-energizing uh, program for our staff. Our mission there is to make firmness Energy number one employer in Northern Ireland. In 2021, we had 76% of our staff believe and uh, and say that firms was a good or great place to work and in 2022 despite the challenges that we spoke about earlier that number went to 83 percent so look we're on the right trajectory and we'll continue to make sure we're being fair to our people in terms of being greener not only are we bringing a greener energy to northern ireland but internally um we are driving a lower carbon emissions within our own business and that will continue we have those targets in place for 2023 already and together with the communities and working with communities has always been within the dna we have a very active csr committee and indeed a wider csr culture um, within the business again we'll be working with organizations such as business and community and indeed social enterprise ni to make sure that we continue to actually give back into those communities that, that we serve and luke uh, same question to you we started maybe like 50 months ago we follow some like very rigorous reporting standards on the esg side of things more generally a lot of, uh, reviewing we have to do in the procurement process particularly for our batteries avoiding conflict minerals uh looking at like anti-slavery policy we have to do some really really careful due diligence on the side of procurement I th- i'd say on the greener side what's exciting is because we have uh, these projects are like massive projects that are financed partially through debt we've negotiated like a bit of a first in terms of the interest rate we pay on our debt is directly linked to the carbon we save. We have a direct margin ratchet. So it's actually pretty cool that this is an infrastructure project that like, will uh, directly monetarily benefit as it, sa- as it saves more and more carbon, um, which is actually a really cool like alignment of what capital should be doing. Mm. Um, that alignment of capital and actual value to society is definitely not there. Like We have to optimize purely based off price. Ideally, we'd want to optimize based off purely carbon saving. Those things are not always completely correlated. And then working with communities, yeah, so everywhere we, we build these projects, we ensure we have a net biodiversity gain. Uh, we're going on small plots on low-grade agricultural land, and it's like an important way to support farmers to diversify their revenue streams, actually, in quite a tricky environment. Brilliant. Final question for both of you. As responsible leaders, what are you committed to doing more of or less of in the coming year, Luke? One thing I, I find challenging, right, whether you're Apple... Uh, and you've got all that might, you still find these things very challenging. So I think it's on the procurement side, right? If you're a small player, you can have like very lofty ambitions in terms of what standards you want to apply, right? And as a startup, you ain't going to beat like Volkswagen for buying power with an EV manufacturer. So I think that's been something that's been challenging. And even Apple, right? In every one of, if you've got a phone, what's in your phone battery is will be a combination of uh, lithium, nickel, and, and cobalt. Cobalt's 50% mined in the DRC. Apple have not solved this problem. What we've realized is you just have to have a tiered approach. It's just As you get more power, you take as much as you can. But if you just stop and say, no, nothing will happen, the only people that are manufacturing, say, batteries, are at the moment, or most of them, are either in Korea or China. And so that's really challenging, right? So it's where you're... What are your like red lines is really, really important. Over time, you set what is reasonably practicable given the stage you're at, and you keep taking more and more. If you go on the extremely hard line approach, then nothing will happen. Literally, like, literally nothing. You won't have a phone. <laughs> and so I found that really tricky as something that we need to balance the whole time. And we're constantly debating and saying, can we push more here? Can we push more here without the, the, all suppliers saying no? 
Mm-hmm. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult in a very, in environments that don't have much competition. But what's happening, which is really cool, is like lots of manufacturing capabilities are now picking up. But the reality is space like China are just further ahead on this stuff, partially because a lot of European countries have just not invested, right? And they haven't been very strategic about energy security, as we know from Germany and other places. We've been incredibly poor at thinking about the future um, and thinking long term. Doing more of is is taking more and more uh, on the ESG side of things, as much as is reasonably practical. Uh, and that's the tricky balance. Niall, same question to you. We are committed to more training support for people. We're committed to more community engagement and working with uh, local social enterprises. We've already got a program in place for consumer information and further engagement with respect to our renewable energy future. Because it's one thing us speaking as an industry, and even today, a lot of the the discussion has been kind of industry focused, but actually what matters here is bringing our consumers on that journey and making sure that they, one, uh, are informed and understand what that renewable energy future looks like for Northern Ireland, and we're committed to, to making sure that happens. In terms of less, perhaps a very obvious one, we're committed to less carbon emissions from within our own business, but actually more substantially, uh, we're committed to making sure that there's less carbon emitted. Niall Martindale and Luke Gibson, thank you so much for being guests on The Lens. Um, Great, I suppose, to have access to a CEO of an energy company, a gas company, uh, and great to hear about the exciting plans that lie ahead. And I wish you well. And Luke, fabulous to talk to you as well as a One Young World ambassador and indeed a COO of Field Energy UK. You've been listening to The Lens with me, Sarah Travers. If your business would like help to become more responsible and ensure your workplaces are fairer and that you enhance the planet by becoming greener and work together for the benefit of society, then please do get in touch at www.bitc.org.uk. Thank you so much for listening and tune in next time. Thank you.